It is our great pleasure to welcome you to Skidaway Community Church on this Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. Whether you are worshiping with us here in person or online, we are grateful for your presence as a part of this community this day. We are honored this morning to welcome our friends and neighbors in faith from Messiah Lutheran Church here on Skidaway Island following their service today and an introduction from Joel Morehouse. The Messiah Lutheran Choir will be sharing their gifts and skills with us. So they'll be arriving a little bit late, but we look forward to welcoming them here with us today and following worship today. We hope that you will join them and everyone else who's gathered for worship today in the Fellowship Hall for a time of greeting and getting to know one another better. While you are there, we encourage you to sign up to take part in a new Lenten soup supper series, The Way. We would very much appreciate having the opportunity to hear how many of you will be present so that we can have enough soup provided for all. And we look forward to welcoming you as a part of that class. If you are in need of a book, please let us know and we can make sure that one is provided for you. There will be two in the library that you can take a look at, not to check out, but while you are here in the church, you can take a look and find out what you need to know. It's also important to note that each of these discussions, one of which will be on a Thursday, are stand-alone. In other words, uh, if you can't make one of these classes, don't worry at all about it. Okay, so just come when you're able, when your schedule allows, and we will look forward to sharing and discussion with you. Good morning, friends. I am Joel Morehouse. I've been here since January serving uh, as your organist and working toward rebooting our choir and getting things going again. So um, again, good morning. I wanted to provide a little bit of um, instruction or clarity on how we will be doing our hymns, just so everyone knows when to start and how to follow and everything. Uh, My wife will tell you I'm a very consistent person So I will tell you for our hymns, I will always play through the entire hymn one time before it's time for everyone to start singing. The purpose is twofold, of course, first to help us maybe get the book out and open to the right page so we can find the music, maybe time to stand, those kinds of things. And second, it serves to help us refresh our memory for the tune in case we we haven't seen it in a while. And then after I've played through that tune one time, the, the slide will advance to the words on the screen and we can begin singing together and we'll sing through to the end. So that's how we will be doing our hymns and I hope that that consistency provides you confidence to sing and to sing well. So um, with that, friends, let us worship our Lord. Thank you. Good morning. All of us with unveiled faces are being transformed from one degree of glory to another.
we encourage you to share the peace of Christ with those seated near you and to sign and pass the friendship pad at this time. Friends, I invite you to please be seated as we join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, present in our midst, yet beyond all comprehension, by your light we see light. By your healing we are made whole. By your mercy we know your greatness. Turn, we pray, your gaze upon our weakness and show us the way of your love that we may live with unveiled faces. Through Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And together let us offer the prayer that Christ taught us, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Merciful and gracious God, we bow before your uh, un glasses. We bow before your unending compassion, the measure of our failing short. We have not loved as you command. We have not spoken truly. We have not cared for creation. We're into ourselves. 
what we intend. We have not pursued what pursued. What we mean to avoid, we embrace. Help us to know the mind of Christ, that in all thoughts, words, and deeds, our lives might come to honor you. Amen. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed by the authority of the Holy Spirit working among God's holy people. I declare your sins forgiven. Turn now with unveiled faces and see to the health of all creation as newborn children of God. We serve the Lord with freedom. We worship God with joy and freedom and in joy. Let us present the offerings of our lives to the Lord. Offering plates may be found as you exit the sanctuary. Online giving is also available. As we come before God in prayer this day, we are aware of the many needs in war in the East and rumors of wars, and we ask for discernment in all things. Please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Almighty, all-merciful God, lover of justice and giver of peace, you have made known the awesome mystery of your transcendent glory. We give thanks for Jesus Christ, the one who tore in pieces the curtain that separated us from you. In his name we can approach you and call you by name. We praise you for the hope we can have in Jesus, who walked among your people, transforming all manner of ills into newness of life. When grief besets us, we can turn to him to lift our spirit. When burdened with cares, we are assured that Jesus shares the yoke with us. When our own death confronts us, we can see on the cross that He too passed victoriously through His time of trial. And so we give thanks this day, O God, for the freedom we gain through life in the Spirit. We can lead those who oppress others to change of heart and life. We can proclaim aloud the day of liberty for all of your children with thanksgiving to Christ who arose victorious over all oppressions. We are transfigured by your glory and transformed by your love. Therefore, we set our sights now on the ministry that awaits us whereby the veil of mystery shall be lifted from your face, and all shall know that you are God with us at our side always in Jesus Christ. So hear our prayer for your people Israel, for the church of Jesus Christ, and for all who seek your face for leaders and elders that they will abide by your commandments, for the earth that you have made trembling for redemption and recreation, for those who are tormented by the demons of illness, addiction, and grief. And now, by your Spirit, O God, enlighten our hearts, open our minds, fill our vision with your radiance, and give us life as we hear your word today. Amen. Our first lesson this day comes to us from the Old Testament book of Exodus in the 34th chapter. I invite you now to hear the word of God. 
Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all of the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. And Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near And he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of of Moses that the skin of his face was shining and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with them. Friends, this is the mysterious word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Upon the mountain, one my Lord spoke, out of God's mouth came fire and smoke. Looked around me, it looked so fine, till I asked my Lord if all was mine. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Jordan River, chilly and cold, it chills the body but not the soul. There is but one train upon this track, it runs to heaven and then right back. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make these dwellings, one three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified, and they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice has spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things 
they had seen. sent to me by a couple from my previous congregation whom I remember fondly and well. And after cutting the tape on this package and the outside of the box and then noticing a gift inside, I called out to my oldest son and from the adjacent room he answered my request to come and help unwrap it. Soon Liam cut the ribbon, he removed the decorative bag, he unfolded the tissue paper, and what he revealed was this beautiful metal serving tray. This piece, which had been handcrafted from aluminum by a well-known artist, is a stylized version of the sun. And I marveled at the timing of this gift. One day before Transfiguration Sunday, when both of our scriptures point the way to light and to life. In the New Testament, we learn that Jesus is the Son of God, S-O-N, but also that He is the light which shines in the darkness. He is, to borrow a line from amazing grace, bright shining like the sun, S-U-N. And as the earth revolves around that sun, that most powerful star whose light is experienced so intensely on account of our proximity to it, we know that it is around Jesus that our faith orbits the closer that we draw, the more intensely Christ's light shines in our lives. And the cycle is familiar, isn't it? Each day of every year, we are either pulling away from or drawing closer to the sun. During the winter, In times such as these, even though we haven't had much of a winter at all to speak of here, of course, closer to the equator, but for those who are in more northern climates, the winter is often gray, isn't it? And cold and frigid and snowy because the earth has rotated away from the sun. And meanwhile, during the peak of the summer season, the sun's rays are so unyielding, we know that very well here in Savannah, that we must shield our eyes from it. Like Moses, in the presence of God, we come with veiled faces in the hope that God's glory may not completely overwhelm us. The parallels are uncanny. In the Old Testament, it is often said that ordinary human beings cannot stand in the presence of God. They cannot come face to face with the one true divine being that we call God, lest they will die. And so God's glory is made known in a variety of different forms. God appears in whirlwinds in the Old Testament, in earthquakes, in fire. God's voice descends from the heavens and is present even in the midst of sheer silence. And meanwhile, those who are bold enough to approach God are wise to do so with great caution, for this is holy and dangerous work. This explains why Moses presented himself before God with the veil as he did, attempting to communicate with God in the tent of meeting, for receiving a message from God is no typical mundane matter. And here this morning in our second lesson, God's glory shines no less brightly. 
Jesus ascends a mountain with Peter and James and John, those three disciples with whom he seemed to have the closest affiliation, and he leads them into what could best be described as a mystical experience. There, on the mountain of transfiguration, God's voice booms. And Peter's preconceived notions about what they ought to do next are completely shattered. Shh, says Jesus. Don't speak. Instead, just listen. God tells him to listen to Jesus' guidance, to His wisdom, to His will. For just as Moses interceded so long ago, we now have a new high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. Yes, if we are to think about this theologically for a moment, we know that the transfiguration is an incredibly pivotal moment. This setting on the mountain is presented as the point where human nature meets God. The meeting place of the temporal and the eternal with Jesus Himself as the connecting point, acting as a bridge between heaven and earth. Peter, James, and John are there to see it all, and yet they still do not fully understand. They still do not fully comprehend, perhaps because understanding does not come easily to us who are made in human flesh, no matter what our proximity to Jesus. How often is it true that we will lean in to what God is saying to us in that moment and we are so convinced that we are on the right track and we are doing exactly what we are supposed to be doing and surely God is there praising us for all that we are doing and saying yeah we've really got it right this time and then we learn otherwise we learn that something else is happening and stirring in our midst and that perhaps we only know in part. The light of God's glory continues to astound us no matter where we are in our journey of faith. The glory of God continues to confound our simplistic understanding of the eternal with images as acceptable and accessible as seeds and laborers and family strife like the parable of the prodigal son, for example. And each of these is delivered in this very curious way. The parable, as I've already alluded to, with all of its undercurrents and meanings, taking this very common subject and transforming it, into something divine, heavenly, eternal? What if, as one theologian suggests, this strange story of Jesus transfigured is itself a kind of parable of Jesus? What if this episode is not actually meant to explain Jesus, but rather to point to Jesus? What if this is more like a picture that we are meant to look at and encounter rather than a problem to be explained away or solved? After all, no one looks at a great piece of art and stands there before the canvas and then exclaims, I got it! I got it! Rather, if it's truly a great work of art, Sometimes you walk away muttering, wow, it really got me. Perhaps the transfiguration is a kind of parable of us here at worship. 
We gather here in our church just wanting to be with Jesus. Maybe we think of Jesus primarily as a wonderful teacher or an inspiring moral example or a good guide along life's ways or all of the other mundane ways that we like to think about Jesus. And we come to church to get our explanations or our rules or our principles for life. And that's okay, isn't it? As far as it goes, but it also has its limits. And sometimes Jesus takes us to another level. Sometimes he leads us beyond our answers and our rules and our certainties. It's as if he takes our hand and leads us up to another realm. And there he shines before us, mysterious and wonderful, beyond our ability to explain or understand. And maybe, just maybe, that's when worship, when church, when we as disciples of Jesus Christ find that moment that is as good as it gets. And we exclaim as those first disciples did on that mountaintop, Master, it is good that we are here. Today in Ukraine, half a world away, we are witnessing the tragedy of misplaced glory, of the human propensity to seek glory for one's nation or for one's self, and yet, ironically, to be completely devoid of it. In his own personal quest for glory, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, is seeking to conquer a sovereign neighbor by force. And in taking the form of an emperor, eager to grab all that he can, he has made a mockery of freedom and justice and even of glory itself. On the Mount of Sinai and on the Mount of Transfiguration, we know what true glory looks like. There we can bask in the glory of the Creator of heaven and earth. There we can be embraced by the glory of the Son who redeems us. There we are sent by the glory of the Holy Spirit who daily sustains us in the midst of all of our needs. There we are reminded every step of the way that glory is finally akin to service rather than domination, to sacrifice rather than personal comfort, to self-giving love rather than finally only being concerned about the self. And we know these things no matter what anyone else would wish to tell us otherwise. Yes, we are people whose lives revolve around the sun. And it is His glory which radiates through us out into the world. In the first chapter of John's Gospel, we hear that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. The darkness, our darkness, couldn't figure Jesus out. We couldn't comprehend God coming to us as a crucified Savior. Yet that we couldn't fully comprehend, explain, or figure him out is, in a way, confirmation of his divinity. Jesus befuddled and confused us, not only on the Mount of Transfiguration, but when he ate with and welcomed sinners, and when he died for us sinners. And when he showed us a way that was not our own way, we just 
couldn't comprehend him. And so I remember yesterday and that very surprising gift that arrived in my box and cutting that box open and asking for the assistance of my son and unwrapping this very meaningful gift from a friend with all of the symbolism and everything that it represents on this particular weekend. The Son of God and the Son of God transfiguring our faces, reminding us of the radiance that the dark shall never overcome. And I think about its purpose. A serving dish. I've just mentioned that those sinners with whom Jesus ate were included at the table. And I think about how a centerpiece in the table reminds us that all are welcome. That there is a place for all, for even us. And as the rays of that sun radiate out, it represents the love of God and the faith that we have in Jesus as our meal and our community revolve around that centerpiece. Our community is strengthened by proximity to the light. Proximity to God. Proximity to the illumination that comes from the Holy One. And as we remember this message today, we affirm that the darkness shall never overcome it. May it be so. And all thanks be to God, both now and forever. Amen. Last week, we affirmed our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed in a traditional form. And this week, we are affirming our faith using that same confession, but with a modern twist. I invite you now to please stand with me as we affirm our faith together using the words that are found in your bulletin and on our screen. We believe in God Almighty, the Creator of heavens and earth, who blesses all people and every creature on earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, the only child of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and who suffered under the Roman Empire, and was crucified, died, and was buried. He rose on the third day and is now seated at the right hand of God Almighty. He will come to give justice to the oppressed and the oppressor. We believe in the Holy Spirit who guides the church to walk in the path of justice and righteousness and in the fellowship of the faithful. We believe in the power of love and forgiveness which can bind and heal the church and community from the vileness of hatred among people, groups, for the renewal of humankind. And again, friends, I would like to welcome together with you the choir from Messiah Lutheran Church, our neighbors here on Skidaway Island. They're going to sing a piece today for us, um, which is asking the questions of justice, and then in the end quotes, as we know, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Um, I think you'll very much enjoy it. And of course, if you are yourself moved by the choral singing today or interested in more choral singing here at Skidaway, we are hoping to get our choir started again, so I would welcome you to speak to me personally after the service today. I will be here in the church and in Liston Hall as well. And you can also reach out to me by email. So hope to be in touch. Enjoy the music.
the Lord in the freedom of the Spirit. May the glory of the Lord shine upon you. The Word of the Lord live within you. The Spirit of the Lord give you peace. Alleluia and Amen. <laughs> 